Hi, everybody. Dr. Horner with Infectious Disease. Today, we're going to talk about diagnosis and management of meningitis and, and CNS infections. So we're going to talk a little bit about bacterial meningitis and then a bit about viral meningitis like West Nile. There's actually a lot of West Nile going on right now, and uh, especially in Nebraska. And there's a um, uh, the uh, health department put out an alert about all the West Nile that's been going on uh, in uh, Nebraska. So we'll, we'll talk a bit about bacterial meningitis and uh, a bit about viral meningitis in West Nile. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to put in the chat any questions that you have, and I'll make sure to address uh, any of the questions. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. And we're going to talk about bacterial meningitis. I think this is uh, a good topic. We, we talk about this um, where we've been getting a lot of questions about bacterial meningitis and viral meningitis lately. Um, so as far as bacterial meningitis, uh, it's an inflammation of the meninges. So it's, it's inflammation. So uh, in general, what that means is if you, if you look at uh, CSF, there has to be a lot of uh, cells in there to have inflammation, to show inflammation. And so if there aren't a lot of uh, cells in the CSF, uh, inflammatory cells, then you wouldn't say they have meningitis. So once you get an LP, if they have zero to five uh, cells, then you'd say they don't have meningitis and you don't have to worry about uh, worry about meningitis and giving antibiotics for that anymore. So you can have bacterial virus, uh, you can have a, a meningitis caused by fungus, which you know generally just happens in people that are really immunocompromised. Um, but the other things that, that can happen, you can, you can get a aseptic meningitis from certain drugs like NSAIDs. So if someone is on uh, um, uh, some, uh, if they're on NSAIDs or if they're on um, Bactrim, Bactrim is another big one that um, can cause an aseptic meningitis. So if they have all the signs of, of meningitis, uh, they get an LP, their CSF looks like meningitis, but uh, nothing grows, then it could be an aseptic meningitis either from a viral cause or medication-induced uh, aseptic meningitis. So it's important to look at their medications and see, you know, if sometimes they've say, they'll say they've been on, uh, they've been in a lot of pain lately, and so they've been taking a lot of NSAIDs. Um, or if you look on their medication list and they have Bactrim, then you can uh, maybe able to implicate that in their uh, aseptic meningitis and, and say it's a medication-induced uh, meningitis. So here, the classic triad for meningitis is, is fever, a stiff neck, and altered mental status. So essentially fever and a headache. So if someone has fever and a headache, you immediately want to think, could this be meningitis? And to start the workup and, and um, you know, if you're considering a bacterial meningitis, then you want to start antibiotics immediately. And this classic triad, it only presents in less than 50% of cases. So uh, it, it's not something that you'd see in all patients, but for sure, if you see this triad, you wanna think about it, uh, think about meningitis. Um, and then a third of patients have neurological signs such as uh, seizures, um, any kind of neurological signs, you wanna um, really take those patients very seriously. If a patient has seizures, it's a poor prognostic indicator, um, which uh, it just shows the severity, which um, can be useful in you know talking to the family and saying that they're having these seizures and that's uh, that would be a uh, uh, you know contribute to a bad prog prognosis for this patient. And then some have impaired consciousness, photophobia, phono uh, phonophobia, which is essentially um, uh, sensitivity, phot photophobia is a sensitivity light, phonophobia is sensitivity to their hearing uh, and vomiting. So these patients, you know, when you walk in the room, they'll be talking about how bad of a headache they have, they'll be covering their eyes, they'll want the lights off, they'll want the shades drawn, um, which is something that you'll see in patients that have uh, a really bad headache just in general. But if they have a fever, then you especially want to be thinking, could, could this be meningitis? Now, as far as isolation, uh, as far as you know, droplet precautions, 
if, if a patient comes in, you're thinking meningitis, uh, then you want to be thinking, should this patient be in droplet precautions? Should this patient be in isolation? And the reason there is for Neisseria meningitis, meningitis. And so for those patients, you want to put them uh, into isolation uh, for the first 24 hours until they're on antibiotics for um, you know, the first 24 hours. And then hopefully by then you'll have the, some cultures back from the LP and you'll be able uh, to tell if it's Neisseria meningitis or if it's another cause. Uh, Neisseria meningitis is the one that we worry about when it comes to um, meningitis going from one person to another person. So Neisseria meningitis, it's known for, for college dorms. So people that are in really close quarters, college dorms um, or military barracks, things where people are, are in very close contact with each other. And then close contact should be given antibiotic prophylaxis. So if there's uh, another patient that's been, or another person that's been in really close contact with your patient, then you wanna discuss with them taking antibiotic prophylaxis to prevent uh, them from getting meningitis and essentially to decolonize them also from Neisseria meningitis uh, in the nares. Um, and as far as who gets this antibiotic prophylaxis, it's generally people that are very close to the patient. They've been in very close contact. So um, like a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a husband and wife would, would want to, uh, you'd want to discuss with them getting antibiotics to prevent meningitis uh, in, in them. Uh, other people would be, you know, the, the person, and that, that's a popular test question, uh, the person that's uh, intubated the patient. So if the patient needed to get intubated, uh, whether it was the ER doctor or whether it was the um, uh, ambulance uh, EMS person that intubated the person, you know, usually when you intubate someone, you're really close, close to next to their face. So they would have gotten, you know, really close and, and would have gotten exposed. Uh, generally, that this test question asks who should be uh, given antibiotic prophylaxis, and it's the person that intubated them, uh, their husband or wife. If they have another person that lives in the dorm that's been, you know, living in the dorm room with them for um, a good amount of time, they, they're the um, recommendations are actually not very absolute. Of, of they don't clearly define what close proximity or close contact is, but generally it's someone that's been within, they'll say something like four to six feet. So like a small dorm room within six feet for a good number of hours. So um, the people that generally don't need antibiotic prophylaxis would be the, um, the nurse that checked them into the ER, uh, their bedside nurse in the ER, um, the uh, uh, someone that was in their classroom with them in, in college or their professor. Um, but uh, it's kind of interesting, those studies about close contacts and, and uh, which antibiotics to give. So you can give rifampin, um, POBID for two days, or one dose of Cipro, or one dose of ceftriaxone. And, and the interesting thing that those studies that, that check which antibiotics can be given uh, were actually done, uh, well, there was one of the studies that, that's included was actually done at Creighton University and they swabbed the medical students in the infectious disease course. They, they swabbed their nares and saw if they were growing Neisseria meningitis. And if, if they were growing it, they were offered um, uh, prophylaxis, they were offered antibiotics and they split them into groups to see which antibiotics would get rid of it. And so they gave them antibiotics and then they checked them again and, and swabbed them again and saw if, it, if they got rid of it or not. And so that, so part of the recommendations of what antibiotics to give was, was from a study on medical students at Creighton University, which um, you're not really supposed to do medical, use medical students in, in, uh, in your studies, but, um, yeah, so rifampin, Cipro, or ceftriaxone. So if um, a person is uh, needing uh, antibiotic prophylaxis to prevent Neisseria meningitis, or, or they want to eradicate themselves, then these would be the options, and you would discuss with the patient, you know, what would be best for that patient. 
Now, <clears throat> as far as my serum meningitis goes, um, when we talk about a rash, not like meningitis and the patient has a rash, th this is purpura fulminans, uh, purpura fulminans. And this is generally what we talk about. This is Neisseria meningitis. And this is gonna be from Neisseria meningitis bacteremia. But uh, you know, they, if they have nice, Neisseria meningitis, um, really uh, advanced cases or severe cases may also have Neisseria meningitis in the blood and they can get this rash and, um, but this is uh, really bad cases. And, and the, the glass here that's used is actually to show if there's blanching or not. So that's why they would use a, uh, like a glass to, to see if the uh, erythema there will blanch. And you can see it's non-blanching there. And this can especially be bad in, in children. And some of the cases that, um, you know, every once in a while you'll see these cases in the news and some of the really bad cases, they can lose fingers or toes or, or, uh, or worse. And, you know, there are popular cases where, you know, a college student, um, will lose their fingers and, um, you know, they may have been a concert pianist or something, and then they, they lose their fingers. It's very, uh, very bad cases. And so I just want to point out the rash so everyone can uh, be familiar with that. And then a lumbar puncture. So here's a picture of a lumbar puncture being done and the collection of the fluid. So not only is it a good idea to do a lumbar puncture and, and collect fluid, it's also good to, to check the opening pressure. And so that's what this person is doing here on this side. They're checking the opening pressure to see what the pressure is. Bacterial meningitis can have extremely high pressure Fungal meningitis can have high pressure. Uh, viral meningitis may have the pressure a little bit elevated uh, or, or it could be in the normal range. Now, if the pressure is extremely high, it'd be a good idea to remove some of the fluid and then get a closing pressure also. And you don't wanna remove too much at one time and, and decrease it, you know, if it's extremely high, you don't wanna decrease it to, to the normal range because that having such a big swing in, in pressure um, may also cause problems, but generally about um, uh, a normal pressure would be below about 20. And then uh, if it's higher than 20, then you want to talk about how much to remove and what your concern is for uh, a fungal meningitis um, if it's extremely high um, and the person is really immunosuppressed. As far as CSF lab values and studies here, you want to get a cell count, you want to do a gram stain. So the, the gram stain, um, if the gram stain, uh, if you order a gram stain, you can actually get that immediately. So you can take the fluid and you know, we'll walk it to the lab sometimes and, and ask the, uh, go to the micro lab and say, can you please do a gram stain on this right now? And then you can see if it's positive immediately. And I, I think that's a good plan, you know, especially if you're really worried about the patient to um, see if you can find out what it is immediately. Uh, just make sure there's no delay. Now, even if you don't see anything on gram stain, I wouldn't change the antibiotics at all. And the reason there is because uh, it, it's um, it's not perfect. So when it comes to sensitivity and specificity, the sensitivity for doing a gram stain on CSF fluid, um, not great. The specificity, you know, if it sees something, saying that it is, <clears throat> uh, that that is the problem that, you know, if you have, Gram positive cocci or, or um, uh, you know, you know, in chains or um, that, then you'd be saying that the likelihood of this being strep pneumonia uh, is is extremely high, and you could stop the other antibiotics and, and target strep pneumonia. And bacterial culture <clears throat> will take a couple days, so if your concern is high, you'd want to keep them on antibiotics and and de-escalate um, when you have the organism. AFB stain and culture. So this doesn't need to be done on all patients. It's gonna be acid fast bacilli. These um, would be in, in patients that you're uh, generally that are very immunosuppressed and you're worried about uh, TB meningitis or a, a non-TB mycobacterium causing the problem. Uh, fungal stain and culture, um, also something that can be done, protein, glucose, 
Now, uh, this is uh, obtaining an opening pressure and closing pressure is good, if, especially if you're concerned about uh, fungal, fungal meningitis. If there are other exposures, then you can test other things. Um, out of this list here, I think West Nile would be one of the most important. So West Nile is going to be IgG, IgM serology. So it's antibody. Uh, and we'll talk more about West Nile. I, I'm going to talk a, a bit about West Nile um, uh, after we discuss uh, bacteria, bacterial causes of meningitis. And then over here, we have the meningitis encephalitis PCR panel. So if, if your lab is able to do that, that can be extremely helpful. So you can quickly get uh, a diagnosis uh, almost immediately. So after the LP is done, you know, this will take a little over an hour to do, and then you, you could have an answer. Now, on this panel, one of the important things here would be herpes simplex virus one and two. So that can, uh, as far as viral causes, that would be the most common uh, viral cause would be HSV one and two, along with uh, enterovirus. Um, so, now, but I will say that if the HSV one and two by PCR is negative, uh, that can sometimes occur in patients with uh, HSV meningitis. And so that is another popular test question where people will, um, it'll say the, that you highly suspect HSV and the patient may even have an outbreak, uh, either a general outbreak or an outbreak of cold sores on their, their lips. And uh, the, if the HSV one and two by PCR uh, is negative, but you don't have any other reason for their meningitis, uh, say that it did look viral on uh, the, your interpretation of the CSF when you got these labs back did look viral. The, the bacterial culture may not be growing after a few days and, and you don't have any other reason for it. You may want to do an MRI and an MRI, you know, if it lights up in the temporal, uh, then you could say that is also consistent with HSV. And sometimes we'll retap them. We'll do another LP and check HSV one and two. And sometimes it will be positive the second time. Um, so if now if it's the MRI is positive for um, you know it lights up in the temporal regions, then you can you can say this is most likely HSV, and then you can discuss with the patient if you want to tap or not tap them. Because um, if your suspicion for HSV is high and it lights up on MRI then uh, you may decide not to tap them since suspicion for uh, HSV is so high. And here's the, so the CSF abnormalities and uh, meningitis when you're evaluating the CSF. <clears throat> now, I like this because it just shows high or low, right? So the opening pressure normal is gonna be about 100 to eight, uh, 180 millimeters. So I was saying 20 earlier, so 20 would be, 20 centimeters uh, of H2O. So I generally think of normal about uh, 20 centimeters or lower. Cell count in a normal CSF is gonna be zero to five. Protein is gonna be less than 40. Glucose 40 to 70. Now in bacterial, you'll have high opening pressure. Viral, it's, it's high or can be normal and fungal, it will be very high. Cell count, it's going to be uh, PMNs is higher in bacterial, lymph is going to be higher in viral, and lymph is also going to be higher in fungal. So it's, it's going to be um, essentially a PMN, like a neutrophil predominant versus a lymph predominant. Now, if they only have four cells or three cells, then you can say uh, it's, it's not going to be a meningitis, and you can disregard the percentage. And that's kind of an important point because I'll frequently frequently get questions about. Um, they'll say they're we. They'll, I'll get a question and they'll say we did an LP and it's 100% lymph, and I'll ask the number of cells and they'll say it was there. There were two cells. <clears throat> now, if you only have two cells, then the percentage isn't important, so you don't have to worry about that. You can just disregard that and say that zero to five is normal, so they don't have a meningitis. Now, the, the protein protein is going to be high. Uh, it can be high in all of them, or it could be normal and viral. And then glucose, it can be 
very low in bacterial causes because the bacteria are also eating the glucose. And it can be normal in, in viral and then fungal can also be low. <laughs> well, now when it comes to what to do with a patient when they first come in, uh, generally the question is uh, what to give and what's the order for doing things. And this is a good algorithm for looking at the order and, and what to give really. So it says suspicion for bacterial meningitis, yes. Now, do, do you wanna give uh, treatment first or should they go to have imaging first? Now, generally the rule is to give um, antibiotics and let nothing hold up the antibiotics. So um, whether they need imaging or not, if they need imaging, you should give antibiotics first because the imaging would hold up giving up giving the antibiotics. So you the, the general rule is don't let anything stop time to antibiotics because time to antibiotics is the most important factor when it comes to mortality. So uh, generally, and I've heard ER doctors say, if I have a patient that comes in, I order the antibiotics immediately. Before, and he says, if, if, the, uh, if I can do the lumbar puncture, he tries to do the lumbar puncture before the antibiotics are given, but if he can't get to it in time, then, uh, then the antibiotics go in first. And it's hard for me to argue about that because uh, that person was in a busy ER and, and would say that if a trauma comes in or a car accident or something you're not expecting, um, they don't wanna look back until I, I, there was a delay to antibiotic time. And that's something that's actually very common. And it, it's, I'm kind of impressed when ER doctors and, and people in general will talk about things, you know, how life actually works. Because if you look at the studies, you can see that time to antibiotics, there can be a large variation. Sometimes time to antibiotic can be hours and hours because, um, you know, if, if you're, you're generally supposed to give antibiotics, but people know that you're supposed to do an LP. Um, if you can do the LP before antibiotics are given, then that would be a good thing because um, if the LP is done after antibiotics, you may not be able to identify um, the bacteria because it won't grow in culture. Uh, which is true. However, the studies won't be completely normal, meaning that you'll still they'll they'll still be consistent with a bacterial or viral cause of meningitis. Um, so you'll still see that they had a meningitis. Uh, and if you're able to do um, the uh, the biofire, then the biofire will be positive, uh, whether antibiotics were given beforehand or not. And the reason is because it may be picking up organism, but it may be picking up dead organism, whereas the culture would it would need to be alive uh, for it to grow. So <clears throat> this this here is to determine whether they need imaging study or not. So if they're immunocompromised, and and really I lump this all together with um, what is the likelihood that they have high intracranial pressure. So when you're doing an LP or, or when you're, when you're doing a CT scan, it's to determine if they have something that will cause high intracranial pressure and increase the risk for them to herniate uh, and from an LP and die from the LP. So these are reasons essentially that, that uh, would show that they have high intracranial, intracranial pressure or um, or, or they're having issues from the high intracranial pressure. So if they're immunocompromised, like untreated HIV, they could have uh, high pressure from, <clears throat> uh, from either an infection or uh, uh, an intracranial, uh, like a brain cancer. History of CNS disease, new onset seizures also uh, go along with high pressure in the brain. Papilledema, altered consciousness, focal neurologic deficit. So any kind of neurologic deficit or delayed uh, or delay in performance of a diagnostic lumbar puncture. Yeah, so uh, if they have any of these things, then the plan would be to get blood cultures, give the antibiotics and the steroid, then do a CT scan and then do the LP. So the reason here to do the antibiotics before the LP 
is because a CT scan can sometimes delay giving uh, delay everything for hours and hours. And so in that study that I was referring to where there was a large delay, it would be because the clinician would say, oh, I know I'm supposed to give the antibiotics um, before the LP, but you know, I'll, I'll do the CT scan really fast. And they'll send the patient to the radiologist and then uh, the, and they'll say, oh, I'll just call the radiologist and, and get that really quickly. But sometimes, like I was saying, if a car accident comes in or, or things get really busy, then it, it'll get a delayed. And then, you know, sometimes in, in that study that, that uh, I'm referring to, they, they delayed antibiotics to sometimes six to eight hours. Um, and so they've actually considered taking out CT scan altogether because the likelihood uh, of having a herniation during an LP is extremely small. And so there's been discussion to take out the CT scan because nowadays everybody gets a CT scan whether they meet this criteria or not. Um, so everyone will get a CT scan before they do an LP, um, even though the likelihood of herniating is extremely low. Um, so if they don't have any of these things, blood cultures and lumbar puncture then give the antibiotics. Um, and if the CSF is consistent with bacterial meningitis, um, so the positive CSF gram stain, if it's consistent with bacterial meningitis, then, um, well, either one, you're going to give your antibiotics and steroids. But the main thing here is not to let anything hold up the, the antibiotics. Now, what antibiotics will you give? Vancomycin, ceftriaxone. Uh, if the patient's over 50 years old, if they're 50 years old or older, you'd be giving ampicillin. Um, also in children and pregnant women, you'd be giving ampicillin for listeria. Um, if there's any concern for HSV, you would, you'd give acyclovir. Now, if they have, that, that will cover the most common causes of, of bacterial and viral meningitis, but you wanna expand coverage if, if they have um, other things like they have a brain trauma. So if they were in a, a car accident or any kind of brain trauma, or if they have a shunt, or if they've been in the hospital uh, with any kind of neurological procedures, then you'd want to change the ceftriaxone to cefepime. Um, you could give um, cefepime or meropenem. Generally, I'll, I'll give uh, cefepime instead of the ceftriaxone and everything else remains the same. The, um, and even though it remains the same, the vancomycin plus ceftriaxone in this case is gonna be uh, given for resistant strep pneumo. So the vancomycin is given for resistant strep pneumo since the likelihood of having MRSA meningitis is extremely small. The only time you worry about MRSA meningitis or staph epi meningitis would be in these uh, recent neurological procedures or brain trauma or shunts. So you'd give the same vancomycin, but the reason for it would change. So normally it's for resistant strep pneumo, but in these cases, it would be for to cover for MRSA and staph epi. Now, as far as which, um, what is the most common bacterial causes? It differs with age. So less than one month, strep A galactiae is number one and E. coli, and then it changes to strep pneumo, and it's basically strep pneumo. Um, and in strep pneumo, here it has Neisseria meningitidis, the most common two to 50. And in some studies, it's strep pneumo still number one. Uh, it differs by study. So really the important thing here is whatever you give, you wanna make sure that you cover strep pneumo really well and Neisseria meningitidis really well. And as far as steroids go, the, the recommended use is to give steroids at essentially at the same time you give the antibiotics. So the steroids are given um, uh, because they show benefit in patients with strep pneumoniae meningitis, so pneumococcal meningitis. Now, it doesn't show benefit in other types of meningitis. And so if, if there's meningitis from another cause, whether it's viral or 
Um, any other cause other than strep pneumoniae, you would stop the steroids when you find out that the cause is not strep pneumoniae. Um, in general, they say not to give uh, steroids later if you find out it's strep pneumo, if you didn't start it at the first dose of, of um, uh, when first dose of antibiotics. But, uh, and the reason they say that is because the, in the studies, they, they really only looked at steroid, uh, that if a steroid would help when it was given at the same time. And they didn't study if it was given, you know, a day or two, starting a day or two later. And <clears throat> viral meningitis. Okay, so now we'll talk about viral meningitis. If you have any questions about bacterial meningitis or any questions at all, you can always uh, put it in the chat. When it comes to viral meningitis, uh, it's the most common form of meningitis. Predominantly lymphs, normal glucose, mild protein increase. Um, and the, the PCR can be positive for HSV1 or 2. Uh, enterovirus uh, is the other co major cause of, uh, of viral meningitis. And serology is needed for West Nile. So we'll talk a lot about West Nile, uh, getting IgG, IgM. And then there's also this thing called Molaret's meningitis. Uh, it's HSV2. And you can remember that because there are two L, Ls in Molaret's. And it's, it's a recurrent HSV meningitis. And so patients will get it, uh, they'll get meningitis, and then they may come back in at a, at a later time, whether it's months or years, uh, sometimes over 10 years later, they can come in with HSV meningitis. And, um, you know, the patient will say, I've had this exact same thing happen to me in the past. And even if they present, <clears throat> if they present with meningitis symptoms and say, I've had meningitis in the past, um, I would still recommend doing an LP and identifying and making sure that uh, it is a viral meningitis because if it's a bacterial cause, then uh, it'd be um, really kind of dangerous to suspect or, or to tell the patient, oh, this is probably Mollerets meningitis, you don't need antibiotics. Um, so I would still do an LP and confirm that it's uh, HSV. Uh, and it's a, a viral cause. Now, in those patients, before they even knew that it was uh, from HSV, that HSV was the cause, in, in those patients, they would still recover and they still did okay. Um, but you would you would give acyclovir or val acyclovir to reduce the duration of symptoms and 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 reduce the severity. So I would still give these patients acyclovir or val acyclovir. Uh, to give them treatment so that, you know, because uh, it, it can cause a really, really bad, uh, and if it were me, I, I would want, would want treatment for it. Now, I will make a differentiation between HSV viral meningitis and an HSV uh, encephalitis. Encephalitis uh, the, and the difference between like a meningitis and encephalitis is that the encephalitis, they can have a lot of confusion um, and they can have altered mental status, which happens more so in encephalitis than meningitis. Clinically, you would do the same thing. You would still be doing an LP and you would still be giving them uh, acyclovir, but uh, an HSV encephalitis can be devastating. And clinically for the family, it can look like a stroke. Uh, and they may never really recover from that. So it's important to um, you know, treat all these very, very aggressively. Now, when it comes to West Nile, so I do wanna talk a, a bit about West Nile because there's quite a bit of West Nile going around. So one place to find out how, how much West Nile is in the community is this ArboNet. ArboNet, this is through the CDC, and they will say how many cases. And so this is uh, this is up-to-date information. So this is current as of uh, August 15th. So total cases in 2023, 190. Neuroinvasive ca cases in 2023, 130. And cases reporting uh, human cases in 2023, 27 states. So... 
this is up-to-date information and it shows what states. So, and every year they will do this and you can look back on previous years and see what was the number one state for neuroinvasive cases or just cases in general. And part of this depends on testing and getting it identified. <clears throat> so uh, that's also why it's very important to test your patients and see if they do have West Nile. So this is currently what it's looking like. And uh, in the past, Nebraska has been number one with neuroinvasive cases. Arizona has also been in uh, uh, one of the top places. And it's interesting because you think of mosquitoes causing West Nile, and then the question would be, well, why is it in Arizona? Arizona is a desert. Uh, and uh, one of the answers to that um, is thought to be that there are so many swimming pools in Arizona, and a lot of uh, snowbirds, though people will go to Arizona and then leave, and then they leave their pool, and then a lot of pools not being cleaned and, and uh, allows for a lot of mosquitoes. Uh, so there are so many pools that are, are just not being cleaned and are, are um, causing good places for mosquitoes to, uh, um, to cause problems. Here, West Nile, <clears throat> so amplifying host are birds. And it was first in the United States in New York in 1999. So this is an interesting case when it comes to epidemiology because it went to New York and uh, the Bronx Zoo and people were noticing a lot of birds all over. And um, they, it's kind of known for having infected birds and, and having dead birds because the, the virus is spread and, and birds get it, and then you have a lot of dead crows. And that's uh, also a popular test question when they have dead birds in, in, uh, in, a, in a region, you want to think, could this be West Nile? But it's, it's named after uh, West Nile District of Uganda in 1937, where it was first uh, identified. And when it comes to transmission and things, they, it goes into birds and that amplifies, amplifies it. Um, and then humans and horses are dead end hosts. So horses can get it and people get it, but once people get it, it doesn't spread person to person. Um, and, uh, the mosquitoes don't pick it up from people. Uh, the mosquitoes are picking up from the, from the birds. And then when it comes to infection, most people over 80% have no symptoms. And then some people just have West Nile fever, which is just essentially a febrile illness and they get a bit of a fever. But then in uh, less than 1%, they'll get a neuroinvasive disease. So they get a meningitis or encephalitis <clears throat> and actually come in presenting with um, meningitis-like symptoms. So most people are gonna be just fine. But what, what uh, dictates whether the person is gonna get bad disease or not? Well, part of that's gonna be age and uh, and their health, overall health, which I'll talk about in just a second. But incubation is gonna be two to 14 days. Um, and what's now fever is just when someone gets a little bit sick. And then if they get very sick with neuroinvasive disease, um, you know, that's gonna be encephalitis, meningitis, uh, and uh, uh, neuro symptoms. Now, when it comes to overall um, how they're doing, the fatality is, rate is actually very low. However, the morbidity is very high. So they can actually have symptoms persist for months um, and sometimes years. So um, they, can, they can be very bad and, and very debilitating in, in some, some people. Uh, we've even had some young people in, in their 20s that were um, uh, highly debilitated. Now, risk factors for severe disease, you're gonna think age is a major one, age is, is the biggest one. And then diabetes, hypertension, cancer history, you know, how is their overall health? When it comes to age, the older they are, the more likely that they're gonna have neuroinvasive disease and have like a meningitis picture. So it really happens more in, in uh, the older population than, than the younger population. And when it comes to mosquitoes, Culex is the type of mosquito so, and, and vertical egg transmission. So that's gonna be, if a mosquito gets it, they can pass it on to the, their 
uh, their eggs and future mosquitoes. And the Culex, there are different types of Culex mosquitoes, uh, and they have different kind of regions. But Culex tarsalis mosquito is the major uh, major one that has west Western equine encephalitis, St. Louis encephalitis, West Nile virus, and you can tell because of this white spot right here. So if you are out at the lake and you're getting bitten by mosquitoes and you hit a mosquito and you look at it and it looks like this, um, it's probably better not to look at it. <laughs> so here's the band on the proboscis. So you can see that white band there and you can look at it and you say, oh, you know, you can impress your friends and say, I know what type of mosquito this is. I guess it depends what kind of friends you have. If they're gonna be impressed or not. West Nile virus antibody testing. You can look at IgM and IgG. Now, generally, IgM is gonna be the most important one here because it can tell you if they've had, uh, if they have recent infection. If the IgM is negative and IgG is positive, then you're gonna say that's most consistent with previous exposure or previous disease. And if IgM is positive, then you'd say, oh, that, if IgM is positive and IgG is positive, you can say that's consistent with current disease. Or if IgM is positive and IgG is negative, that's also consistent with, with uh, current disease. And now you'd, you'd wanna get the serology ideally from CSF, but if you wanna do uh, blood serology, that works too. If you wanna just check it uh, in the blood, um, you know, uh, I would recommend that, say, if you don't want to do an LP, um, if they're not that sick, if they just kind of have a fever or they're actually, you know, uh, very, um, you know, high performing, they're doing just fine. And, and we actually did that recently. We had someone that just said, you know, I'm, I'm not that bad. Um, <clears throat> patient had actually been in Colorado and uh, on a lake and he would said, I, I've gotten a lot of mosquito bites, but he had a headache, but, you know, he wasn't that bad. And we checked serology and it was positive. And uh, we just let him know that, that that's what it was. Now, I would only recommend doing that if the patient is looking so good and you're, you're very uh, confident this isn't, that it's not gonna be a bacterial cause of meningitis. <clears throat> now, here's the viremia. Symptom onset is gonna be, this starts at zero at symptom onset. The IgM goes up quickly and then the IgG starts later. So if they've had a short duration of, of symptoms, then you can say, oh, that's um, the IgM positive and IgG negative. That's that's what uh, I would expect. There is no treatment. I've, I've of, I often get questions about, should I give steroids? Steroids haven't been proven to help. And they actually, sometimes steroids can actually hurt. So I don't give steroids to West Nile patients because there's, there's, no uh, there's no proven benefit. And there is an urge to you want to do something, you want to give them something, but I wouldn't recommend giving uh, giving steroids. And these patients frequently require help with daily activities following acute discharge and often report substantial function and cognitive difficulties for up to a year. So when families ask me, how are they, what is their prognosis? How are they going to do in the future? I'll tell them sometimes it takes a really long time for them, for the patient to improve. So it can take a long time. <clears throat> and just to summarize, uh, West Nile remains an important cause of neurologic infections. 80% uh, of people who are infected will not show any symptoms. So it's not uncommon if, if you see a patient that has West Nile and their family and friends are fine. There's no proven effectiveness of treatment or vaccines, <clears throat> but it's still important to, to know that they have West Nile so you can stop unnecessary antibiotics. You don't need to continue a workup if you have uh, the answer and direct public health prevention measures to know it's in the area. Now, now what type of prevention measures? So you wanna drain areas around the house or, or around your yard and everything that has standing water. Dress appropriately. So you wanna uh, wear long pants, long shirt, uh, even though it's hot out, if you're gonna be in an area with a lot of mosquitoes. Uh, dawn and at dusk are when these mosquitoes bite and you wanna use something with DEET because uh, DEET has been proven to be effective to prevent uh, prevent these mosquitoes. <clears throat> okay, so we're a couple minutes over. Any questions at all about any of this? This is kind of a lot of information, uh, but hopefully a lot of it is review.
So as you're seeing these patients, you know, another common question would be, can I get this again? Um, and once you've gotten it once, you can't get it again. You're going to have um, serology. You're going to have antibodies to it. So you won't be getting it a second time. <laughs> and the, But the recommendation would be if you're going to that area, you know, with family and everything, that your family should also uh, be aware of, you know, these kind of recommendations, dressing and not go out when the mosquitoes are out. And, and uh, they call it mosquito avoidance, which um, is kind of funny because it's uh, kind of hard to avoid mosquitoes. All right, so if anyone has any questions, um, you can email me anytime and I hope you found this helpful. Uh, please call us with any questions. We're available um, all the time for any questions if anything comes up. All right, thank you everybody.